Today on Legalese, we are talking about the landmark Supreme Court case of Prince of the United States in our latest installment of Today in Supreme Court History. Hey, greetings. Welcome back, everyone, to Legalese. My name is Bob. I am your host, and I want to thank you all so much for joining me here today. Uh, and if you are new to this program, let me extend a special welcome to you. Uh, this is a podcast where we're going to be discussing uh, current events, mostly in law, politics, and culture. Now, uh, today, we are going to be talking about the 1997 case of Prince v. United States, which was a landmark case in upholding uh, the anti-commandeering doctrine. Uh, before I get into that, though, real quick, let me remind you guys, you can find this show uh, in a number of different formats uh, on a number of platforms. There is uh, the video version, which is kind of the best way to watch it, I think, which is uh, available on YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey. We do also have the audio-only version available over on Anchor. Uh, and if you go to Substack, you can find the audio and video version of the show, plus a bunch of really good write articles that I write, mostly on issues of constitutional law. Uh, there are links to all of those down in the video description. Now, for newer viewers to the show, the reason I call this segment Today in Supreme Court History is because we are going to be discussing a case on an important anniversary of the case. Because it was today, in 1996, that this case, Prince of the United States, was argued before the Supreme Court uh, by two of our country's finest litigators, uh, Stephen Halbrook for the uh, petitioners and Walter Dellinger for the respondents. And this video will actually be the first of three in a series I'm going to be doing uh, where we're going to be covering the anti-commandeering doctrine. Now, this is a topic that I discussed quite a bit uh, in my new book, Constitutional Sleight of Hand, an Explicit History of Implied Powers. Uh, namely the cases of Prigg v. Pennsylvania, which was the very first case uh, to outline the anti-commandeering doctrine, uh, as well as the 2012 case of NFIB v. Sibelius, which is not really considered a landmark uh, anti-commandeering doctrine case, but which did deal with the doctrine in a portion of the case that challenged the Medicare expansion program. But today, we are just going to be focusing on the case itself, Prince v. United States, uh, in its own right. Uh, and then I will uh, also be doing uh, a video coming up here soon about the uh, anti-commandeering doctrine itself, where we'll be going into uh, an in-depth discussion of its origins in the Tenth Amendment uh, and the basic concept of federalism. Uh, and then we will be rounding off that series with a third video that is going to be looking at all five landmark Supreme Court cases uh, that are really considered fundamental to the anti-commandeering doctrine. We're going to be looking at those cases in depth to discover the meaning and scope that each brought to our understanding of this doctrine. But to sum the doctrine up uh, briefly, at least as it pertains to uh, the case before us today, Prince v. United States, so the anti-commandeering doctrine provides a powerful tool to undermine uh, an overreach of unconstitutional federal power. So what is this doctrine and what is it based upon, I hear you asking? Well, while most people tend to assume that the feds have really sort of the final say in all matters when it comes to the scope of federal and state power, uh, people just seem to assume that when the feds say jump, states and local governments say how high. But given that the federal government was intended to limit its actions to constitutionally delegated powers and all other authority was left to the states and the people as per the Tenth Amendment, uh, with that in mind, how do we hold the federal government in check and how do we stop it from exercising powers that it was not delegated? Now, this isn't a new question by any means, uh, and this was one that the anti-federalists uh, and uh, just those generally skeptical of the Constitution's ability to provide a meaningful check 
on the federal government uh, raised during the ratification debates. And I think these concerns were really typified uh, by Richard Henry Lee uh, writing under the pen name Federal Farmer in his 10th letter when he said, The state governments, then, we are told, will stand between the arbitrary exercise of power and the people. True, they may, but armless and helpless, perhaps with the privilege of making a noise when hurt. But this is no more than individuals may do. Does the Constitution provide a single check for a single measure by which the state governments can constitutionally and regularly check the arbitrary measures of Congress? Now, this question was one that James Madison offered an answer to in Federalist 46. Uh, in his own blueprint for resisting federal power, Madison would offer uh, a number of of actions, but most significantly, what he would suggest would be that should an unwarrantable measure of the federal government be unpopular in particular states, which would seldom fail to be the case, or even a warrantable measure be so, which may sometimes be the case, the means of opposition to it are powerful and they are at hand. He says the disquietude of the people, their repugnance and perhaps refusal to cooperate with the officers of the union, the frowns of the executive magistracy of the state, the embarrassments created by legislative devices, which would often be added on such occasions would oppose in any state difficulties not to be despised. This would form in a large state very serious impediments and where the sentiments of several adjoining states happen to be in union would present obstructions which the federal government would hardly be willing to encounter. So, the anti-commandeering doctrine is a long-standing Supreme Court doctrine which, really in a nutshell, prohibits the federal government from commandeering state personnel or resources for federal purposes. Now, in effect, the federal government is constitutionally prohibited from requiring states to use their personnel or resources to enforce federal laws or implement federal programs. Now, state and local governments cannot directly block federal agents themselves from enforcing federal laws or implementing federal programs, but they do not have to cooperate with the feds in any way, and the feds largely rely on state cooperation for most federal laws and programs that are instituted in the country because they simply do not have the resources at the federal level to do this all themselves. This is why it is such a powerful tool. So, for instance, a, a local sheriff cannot block ATF agents from enforcing a federal gun law. However, the ATF cannot force a sheriff or a sheriff's office to participate in the enforcement effort. So moving on to the case here, Prince. Uh, Prince followed the 1992 case of New York v. United States, which held that Congress could not commandeer or, in other words, force state legislation to take certain actions, such as enacting new legislation. Now, Prince would actually expand the anti-commandeering doctrine, and this decision held that Congress could not commandeer state executive branch officials, such as a sheriff, while implementing a federal program. Now, as to the uh, basic facts of the case, uh, the case of Prince began really in 1993 when Congress enacted the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act. Now, this law proposed a national database that would allow federal firearms dealers to instantly check the background of prospective handgun purchasers. This system, however, would take some time to develop, and during this period, the legislation had tasked the chief law enforcement officer of each jurisdiction to conduct these background checks. It was this law that was challenged by two sheriffs. There was Jay Prince of Ravalli County, uh, who was bringing suit on behalf of all 
chief law enforcement officers in Montana. And then there was also Richard Mack of Graham County, who is bringing his case on behalf of all uh, chief law enforcement officers from Arizona. Now, they argue that the federal government could not force them to perform federal background checks, which could delay or even prevent people in their communities from purchasing firearms. And in both cases, the district courts found that the background checks were unconstitutional, but ruled that since this requirement was severable from the rest of the Brady Bill, a voluntary background uh, check system could remain. Now, on appeal from the Ninth Circuit's ruling that the interim background check provisions were constitutional, the Supreme Court would grant cert, and it consolidated the two separate cases brought by Prince and Mack into this one case. And so when this case reaches the Supreme Court, the question presented before the court was, using the necessary and proper clause of Article One as justification, can Congress temporarily require state chief law enforcement officers to regulate handgun purchases by performing these duties called for by the Brady Bill handgun applicant background check. Now, in this case, the court would split 5-4, uh, and the court's primary holding said that no, the court uh, essentially constructed its opinion on the old principle that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction. The court explained that while Congress may require the federal government to regulate commerce directly, in this case, by performing background checks on applicants for handgun ownership, the Necessary and Proper Clause does not empower it to compel uh, chief law enforcement officers to fulfill its federal tasks for it, even temporarily. Now, the court added that the Brady Bill could not require chief law enforcement officers to perform related tasks of disposing of handgun application forms or notifying certain applicants of the reasons for their refusal in writing, since the Brady Bill reserved such duties only for those chief law enforcement officers who voluntarily accepted them. Now, to get into the court's uh, judgment, more broadly speaking, uh, Justice Scalia wrote for the majority, and Justice Stevens wrote for the principal dissent. Now, first we have uh, Justice Stevens, who started off by talking about how, in the first days of the Republic, he said Congress enacted statutes that required state officials to implement federal law. Now, Justice Scalia, however, countered that these federal obligations were imposed only on state judges who could be forced to apply federal law. So Scalia says, the dissent perceives of a simple answer uh, in that portion of Article 6, which requires that, quote, all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support the Constitution, end quote arguing essentially that by virtue of the Supremacy Clause, this would make not only the Constitution, but every law enacted by Congress as well, binding on state officers, including laws requiring state officer enforcement. He pointed out, though, that the Supremacy Clause makes something the law of the land only when those laws of the United States are made in pursuance of the Constitution, and that language is crucial, only when made in pursuance of the Constitution. So the Supremacy Clause, uh, the Supremacy Resolution, I should say, of a significant constitutional question would rest on reasonable implications, he said, uh, finding by implication from Article 2, Sections 1 and 2, that the president had the exclusive power to remove executive officers while finding that article 2 or excuse me while finding that article 3 implies a lack of congressional power to set aside final judgments so essentially justice scalia here is citing and distinguishing between the supremacy clause in article 6 section 2 and the oaths clause of article 6 section 3 
So he says that Article 6, Clause 2 provides that the laws of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. In contrast, he pointed out that Article 6, Clause 3 states that executive and judicial officers of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support the Constitution. So based on this textualist argument, Scalia concluded that the Constitution imposes an obligation to follow congressional commands on state judges, but not executive branch officials. Now, next, the dissent in the case contended that even if the previous uh, anti-commandeering case, New York v. United States in 1992, had been correct, the state legislatures cannot be commandeered, they said that state executive branch officials can be commandeered, and Justice Stevens wrote, The fact that the framers intended to preserve the sovereignty of these several states simply does not speak to the question of whether individual state employees may be required to perform federal obligations. Legislatures make laws. In contrast, the central role of executive branch officers, whether federal or state, is to execute those laws. However, Justice Scalia would uh, reject this distinction. He pointed out that while the Brady Act is directed to individuals, he wrote that the law is directed to them in their official capacities as state officers. It controls their actions not as a private citizen, but as an agent of the state. Now, Scalia would go on to say here that the, distinguish, uh, the distinction between judicial writs and other government actions directed by, uh, or, excuse me, directed against individuals in their personal capacity on the one hand and in their official capacity on the other hand is an ancient one, principally because it is dictated by common sense. We have observed that a suit against a state official in his or her official capacity is not a suit against the official, but rather a suit against the official's office. He goes on, as such, it is no different from a suit against the state itself, and the same must be said of a directed to, directive to an official in his or her official capacity. To say that the federal government cannot control the state, but can control all of its officers is to say nothing of significance. Indeed, it merits the description, quote, empty formalistic reasoning by the highest order. By resorting to this, the dissent does not so much distinguish New York as they do disembowel it, end quote. So the third point that Justice Stevens uh, cites is, a recent example where Congress may have ordered state executive branch officials to take certain actions, and Justice Scalia uh, dismissed the relevant of these recent practices when he noted that their persuasive force is far outweighed by almost two centuries of apparent congressional avoidance of the practice. Now, in addition to the Tenth Amendment case law, uh, the court also has limited federal power under the Interstate Commerce Clause of Article 1, Section 8, as well as Section 5 of the Fourteenth Amendment and the Eleventh Amendment. And in nearly all of these uh, federalism-related cases, and this would include Prince, uh, the court has been uh, narrowly divided by a 5-4 to four vote the way they were in Prince, and uh, the majority in these cases uh, is sometimes referred to as the Federalism 5, and this is generally consists of Chief Justice Rehnquist, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, Antonin Scalia, Anthony Kennedy, and Clarence Thomas, all of whom were uh, appointed by Presidents Reagan and Bush. Now, the Federalism 5 tend to argue that there are fixed boundaries between federal powers on the one hand and state and local powers on the other, and that the court must be willing to define and enforce those boundaries. 
Now, on the other hand, the dissenters uh, usually is made up of Justices John Paul Stevens, David Souter, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Stephen Breyer, most of whom have charged the court with improperly encroaching on legitimate national legislative powers. Now, one final point made by the dissent in this case argued that the Brady Act was valid because the Tenth Amendment imposes no limitation on the exercise of delegated powers. And furthermore, Justice Stevens found that the necessary and proper clause was an affirmative delegation of a power in Article I that provides ample authority for the congressional enactment. Now, in reply to this, uh, Justice Scalia uh, rather colorfully, I guess you could say, stated that the dissent, of course, resorts to the last best hope of those who defend ultra vires congressional actions, the necessary and proper clause. And he stated explicitly what Justice O'Connor had only implied in the decision in New York v. United States, which is that courts must separately ask whether a law is both necessary and proper. And Justice Scalia would go on to state this rule fairly succinctly when he said, When a law for carrying into execution the Commerce Clause violates the principles of state sovereignty reflected in the various constitutional provisions we mentioned earlier, it is not a law proper for carrying into execution the Commerce Clause. He goes on to say, uh, and it is thus, in the words of the Federalist, quote, merely an act of usurpation which deserves to be treated as such, end quote. So what Scalia is essentially getting at here is that the Brady Act provision may have been necessary to regulate the interstate firearms marketplace, but forcing the sheriffs to perform these background checks was not a proper exercise of federal power. This usurpation violates the principles of state sovereignty reflected in the Tenth Amendment and other structural provisions of the Constitution. Now, the Supreme Court would go on to reaffirm their distinction between necessary and proper 15 years later in the case dealing with the Affordable Care Act, uh, NFIB versus Sibelius. Now, these and other cases have sparked considerable and often rather contentious debates among scholars and commentators over the court's proper role in defining the scope of federal powers. And in handing down uh, this wave of federalism decisions that came in the last decade of the 20th century uh, and resurrecting doctrines long thought to have been buried in the judicial graveyard, uh, the Rehnquist Court has sometimes been characterized uh, by some as creating a federalism revolution. However, uh, something I have discussed here uh, in the past is that there was nothing revolutionary about these cases. I, I mean, really, except the fact that most scholars had simply assumed since 1937 that the Commerce Clause cases, and especially implied powers cases related to commerce, had been assumed to simply be a thing of the past. All the court did in enumerated powers cases such as Lopez and Morrison and anti-commandeering cases such as New York v. United States and Prince v. United States was to put this kind of tangible limit on enumerated powers and on Tenth Amendment cases the way they had always done before 1937. And the impact of Prince and other federalism decisions really uh, can be difficult to assess. Now, certainly the court's interpretation of the Tenth Amendment and other federalism provisions of the Constitution would suggest that there are obviously clear legal limits to federal power. Uh, and in so doing, the court appears to have bolstered state and local sovereignty. Uh, however, it's worth pointing out that the Brady Bill's mandatory background checks were scheduled to expire uh, really not all that long after the court handed down the Prince decision in 1997 uh, due to that sunset clause in the statute that only 
made it effective until they had a national uh, instant background check system up and running. Now, in addition, it is widely believed that Congress could have required state and local governments to carry out these background checks by conditioning the receipt of federal funds on their willingness to do checks using Congress's constitutional spending power. Uh, Hence, some people would argue that in cases like Prince, uh, they will, in the end, end up having very little impact on the scope of federal power. Now, as to this last uh, charge, this is really at best partially true. Uh, To say the government could have required this as part of the spending power is really uh, a gross misunderstanding or misinterpretation of the actual conclusion drawn in Prince. What was decided was that Congress could have passed this kind of legislation with a stipulation that state and local governments that implement this federal program would receive federal funds for their implementation. However, what this and what all anti-commandeering cases make clear is that the state and local jurisdictions always have the power to say no, with the only consequence being that they would forego receiving the federal funding offered for their participation in this federal program. Now, sadly, most states simply take this money when offered and like to act as though they somehow don't have a choice in the matter uh, because uh, politicians just love spending our money that they pilfer uh, and avoiding responsibility for their actions. And so I guess in this way, uh, such federal funding really gives state governments the best of both worlds. But where this greater point is true is that as far as the commerce and necessary and proper clause aspects of this case are concerned, the limits placed on the new federalism cases such as Lopez and Morrison uh, had little impact since the, I mean, really only a few years after these cases. We had Gonzalez v. Rach in uh, in 2005, and the court would once again return to their really no practical limiting power interpretation of Congress's implied powers under the Commerce Clause. So those are the essentials of this case. Uh, And uh, down in the video description, I will have links to the full opinion of the court in the case of Prince v. United States, uh, as well as a link to where you can go and listen to the oral arguments that were offered in the case uh, by Stephen Halbrook and by Walter Dellinger. And also, for those of you who may want a clearer uh, technical understanding of the laws and cases that were at issue here, I've drawn up a comprehensive case brief for print uh, that essentially condenses the full 90-page opinion of the court down to its essentials in something closer to like about 10 pages. So if you want my condensed case brief, you can find that by going over to my Substack page. Also, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss uh, my future videos on the anti-commandeering doctrine as they come out. Uh, And if you would be so kind as to help me feed Al Gore's rhythm by leaving a comment and let me know what you thought about the video or any aspect of it, uh, as well as uh, taking a second and uh, if you like the video, hit that like button. Uh, If you dislike the video, hit the dislike button. And uh, I'll be back soon with some brand new episodes. So uh, until then, uh, this has been Bob for Legalese. Uh, You guys have been awesome. Uh, And of course, as always, uh, Cartago de Lenda Est.
Got a trunk full of 